Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at The Rock. Well, hello, hello, welcome, welcome. If you do not know who I am, my name is Pastor Jess Roth, Jessica Roth. I am married to him, and he is one good-looking man, and I love him with all my heart. Oh, I love you too, babe. And then I'm also Jim and Deborah's daughter. So, yes, I am the best daughter out of all three. (laughs) I was waiting for Kim to look up. And then I am Luke's big sister, okay? So some of you have come up to me and said, are you married to Luke? No! I am so not married to him. I'm his sissy. So anyways, that's, that way you kind of know who I am because it used to be that when Dan first started marrying, well, first started marrying me, when we first got married, people would go, oh, he's Jessica's boyfriend or oh, he's Jessica's husband. Now it's like, um, who are you? Oh, you're Dan's wife. And I'm like, wait, no, I was here first. Like, so anyways, just And let know. me say this about my wife. She is the most amazing woman that I know. She's awesome, and I just love you, babe. You're the best. Oh, I love you, too. And uh, she's a great preacher, too. Preaches in the Girlfriends Am services. How many of you ladies have heard Pastor Jess just light it up over there? Don't she do a good job? Man, I, I sneak in the back, and I'm listening. I'm like, mm, yeah, girl, that's good. Go for it. Yeah, amen. Hey, and then they have to throw me out. So anyways... <laughs> It's a lot of fun. Tonight, we're talking about a subject, and uh, we're going to get right into it. We're talking about commitment tonight. You know, this morning, we brought our commitments for the three-year campaign. A lot of us did. If you didn't already do that tonight, we're going to give you an opportunity later if you would like to bring a commitment as well, and you need to do that if this is your church. Man, get on board and get involved in what God is doing. But tonight, we thought it'd be fun to just theme out the night and generation to generation. I mean, just isn't it awesome having the youth and the young adults and the adults and the, and the adults, adults, you know, and, and and just everybody together in the sanctuary just praising God. I was looking at this line of, of uh, worship leaders, and you literally had youth, young adults, La Roca, main sanctuary. I mean, all we were missing was the children's ministries, but they're having a good time over there tonight. But that's really neat. And so tonight, our commitment is to the Lord. Our commitment is to one another. Our commitment is to the house. And so we're going to talk about commitment here. Now, commitment's kind of hard to define, isn't it? Yeah, we were having a hard time. I mean, we were looking it up in the dictionary, and, and you get these just wacky definitions like, uh, what is commitment? It's committing to something. Duh. And it's like you didn't answer that at all. You know, now I, I'm a little bit dumber from having read that. So, you know, what are we talking about here? So we thought it'd be kind of fun to interview some people out on the street. And so our video department went out, and they asked some people about commitment you guys want to see it? Check out the overheads. Watch what, hey what guys, we did. Hey, guys, it's Leah here, and I have Kristen and Mike with me, and they just got married at the Rock Church. So we have a question for them. Kristen, Mike, what does commitment mean to you guys? To me, commitment means love, marriage, struggles, mm-hmm. faith in God to get you through it. Yeah. Never giving up on each other. Always sticking by each other's side. That was a great answer. Now, check out these clips and see what everybody else thinks. You should commit to Christ. You should commit to your walk with Christ. You should commit to reading your Bible. That's what makes you grow. Jesus. God. God. Commit to God 100% and to Him only. And to your wife. I don't know. Why do you got it? Okay, give me another one, something that's easier. Oh. Love? Okay. Marriage? <laughs> For life? No matter what happens, you just push through to the end and do whatever it takes to get it done. Like, we're in a band, so. Uh, like, say you steal something, and, like, somebody says, did you steal that? You gotta say, yes, I did. Uh huh, yeah, I did. Got to commit. To helping uh, your fellow man. Family. Family. Commitment is like if you really want something, you're going to put every single thing that you have into it, pretty much persevere even when you know you struggle and pretty much hope that you get over that little brink of struggle. All right. Wow. My favorite was, if you stole something, uh uh-huh, I did it. That one was funny. I also like, um, we're in a band, so, you know, it's like, where are you going with that? How does that say commitment? (laughs) My goodness. Commitment, hard to define but easy to show, right? Commitment may be hard to define, but it's easy to show. When you see commitment, you know that's somebody who's committed. 
very easy to show because you can see it in people's lives. But listen to this. Even though it's easy to show, easy to point out, tough to carry out. Think about that. Commitment, even though it's hard to define, easy to show, it's tough to carry out in our life something that's going to take pressure, something that's going to be hard for us to do. Well, you know, commitment involves a lot of things, but number one, it involves sacrifice, great sacrifice, hardworking, sticking out with something that you want to give up on, but you don't. You stay in there and you drive. You drive yourself to the next step and you drive yourself to the next step. And it is true diligence. Commitment is a diligent heart. And, you know, we're talking about commitment night tonight. And I know that for us, we looked at our pledge for freedom for our future and we went, oh. And then all of a sudden I went, no. This is awesome because you know what, God, that means I get to be in another level of commitment with you. That means I've got to commit my every days to you to make sure this is going to get done. i got to commit the fear that wants to jump in my heart and go, oh, I don't know if you could do that. And then go, oh, no, you just get out of here, fear. In the name of Jesus, you have no place. I'm staying committed to what God has asked me to do. And you see, it is taking it to the next level. It is pushing past our flesh and pushing past what it is that our heart desires or maybe what... The world is telling us is okay. You see, in the world, God and the world are two opposite. You see, the world says it's okay, and God says, oh, no, since when is that okay? I never said that was okay. The world is defining boundaries at the point of, oh, wait, there are no boundaries. And God is saying, listen, commitment means that there are boundaries. There are things that you just don't dabble in. There are places you just don't go. When I ask you to do something because you love me and out of a heart of purity and passion and love for me and drive, then that means that you stick to what I say because daughter, you love me, son, you love me, and I love you, and we're in this together. Our hearts are mended and joined. And that's what commitment is in the Christian world. You see, it's easy to see commitment, but it's not always easy to do commitment. That's right. And I, actually, I, I would like to say this, because we were, we were chatting, and I said, well, what is commitment to you? And he goes, well, you know, there's tons of good stories in the Bible of commitment, and there is tons of good stories on commitment. But we were talking about the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was there, and here he was, Knowing what was coming his way, knowing the sacrifice that was going to need to be made for you and me, knowing that without that, where would we be? There would be no hope. We would have, back in the olden days, we'd have to go back to the old sacrifice, the old ways of doing things. He knew that he was going to be broken open for us. That is true commitment. And you know, that commitment that God gave for us, what can we give? And how much further can we go for him, for our king? But yet we don't. We don't commit to anything. We say we're going we to stay in our marriage and we're going to work it out and we love each other. But, oh, you know, I just, how many times have you heard this, Pastor Dan? I'm just, we're just not made for each other. We're just not made for each other. How about this? They fell out of love. Fell out of love. I just fell out of love. Maybe there wasn't, you know, all the other things, adultery and stuff. You just, you just don't connect. You just don't mesh. We just don't work together anymore. Well, listen, you get God in the center of that, and God says a three-chord strand cannot be broken. You see, there are right ways of doing things in the kingdom, and there are wrong things. And our commitments, so many times, we break them. But what if Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he said, I'm done. I don't want to do this. I- I'm good. I said I would do it, but I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not going to. What if Jesus said, I don't do crosses? Sorry, I came this far, but you know what? I don't do crosses. That's right. Where would we be if he didn't keep his commitment to us? But yet, we are so blessed and so anointed by God to be walking to this next step. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23 in the New King James Version, if you have your Bibles. For to this you were called... Because Jesus Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. Because he did it, guys, that means we can do it too. I can do it because he did it. You can do it because he did it. He left an example for us that you should follow his steps, who committed to no sin. He committed to no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. What are your words that are coming out of your mouth? Who and when he was reviled did not return revile. When he suffered, he did not threaten. And when he committed himself to him who judges righteously. Now that is a great example of commitment. That is a true commitment. 
you can see a person's commitment in a couple of things. If we're going to point out what is commitment, when we take a look at Jesus, the same Jesus we just read about, who we're going to follow his example, notice there's a couple of things that we can see his commitment in. One of those things that you can see is you can see it in his words. His commitment was so strong that he would not revile even when he was reviled. The Bible says no guile was found in his mouth. That he was like a, a silent lamb before the shears. He didn't say anything. He didn't cause a fuss. He went humbly and he went obediently to the cross. He wouldn't say, oh man, why do I have to do this? Oh, this is going to be terrible. This stinks. You know, I don't like the Romans. I don't like the Jews. I don't like all these people. I mean, just, uh, but I'll do it anyways, I guess, because it's the will. No, he didn't say anything. He never complained. He never once said anything cross. He didn't say anything terse. He didn't have an attitude. His attitude was, I am submitted to the will of the Father, and I'm not going to say anything out of line or out of order. He was so committed to In the fact, process. he said, he said, Father, forgive them, for yeah. they know not what they do. The Bible tells us that out of the overflow of the heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You'll find out what people are committed to by what starts coming up out of their mouth. If people are committed to sports, when you start talking to them, they're going to start talking sports. If people are committed to music, when you start talking to them, they'll start talking music. If people are committed to money, when you start talking to them, they'll start talking money. If people are committed to their family, when you start talking to them, they'll start talking family. It'll come out of their mouth. But also, you can see someone's commitment. Remember, we said it's easy to see. You can see it in their actions. Just like Jesus humbly went to the cross, we saw his commitment. We saw how much he loved us when he stretched out his arms on the cross, gave up his spirit, and died for us. That's how far his commitment went. And in the same way, in our actions, you can see how committed a person is. Do they show up for church? Do they show up for church just once every couple of weeks, once a week, twice a week? Hey, you know how committed people are when they're there three, four, five times a week, and they're volunteering, or they're, you know, involved in something, they're doing something. You can tell, man, that person is a committed person. Why? Because their life now speaks. They show it. Man, they're carrying their Bible to work. They're having Bible study at lunchtime. They're doing, they're telling somebody about Jesus, and you can see through their actions where their commitment is. And the final one that I want to tell you tonight is you can tell where someone's committed. Get ready, because this one might hurt a little bit. You can tell where someone is committed by where they give their money. Hello. Because if you really want to know where someone's committed, what does the world say? Put your money where your mouth is, right? Talk is cheap. It's one thing to say something, another thing to do something, another thing to give to something. And we can see the examples throughout the Bible of people who were so committed to the cause of Christ, so committed to their Lord, so committed to God, it didn't matter they were going to give. We see guys like Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Now, it wasn't just that you got around him and you liked him. No, this guy sold lands and possessions. He came and he laid the money at the apostles' feet, and everybody got blessed by his example. See, he put his money where his mouth was. He wasn't just an encourager in word and indeed patting people on the back and giving them hoorahs and all that kind of stuff. No, he was going to put something of substance, something that cost him something, a sacrifice. We can see what commitment is in our words, in our deeds, and where we spend our money. Just take a look at somebody's checking account, look at their balance sheet, and you'll know where they're committed. Is the tithe there on the 1st and the 15th? If it is, you know they're committed. Is there offerings in there? Is there things going on? Hey, if it is, you know they're committed. And that's what God has taken a look at. He looks at our hearts. He sees that. Now listen, anything less then a 100% radical commitment to Christ is no commitment at all. It's how God defines it. We see that in his word. In fact, in the book of Revelation, you'll find Jesus, he's speaking to a church. This is so crazy to me that Jesus is speaking to a church, and he says, when I come, I want to find you hot, or I want to find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are pretty graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is Jesus saying about commitment? He's saying, look it, if you're going to be committed to me, if you're going to be a Christian, a real Christian, hot or cold, what's he saying? In or out. Because if you're lukewarm, if you're trying to ride the fence, he says, that's not going to fly. That's not a wholehearted commitment, and I will either have all of you or none of you. And if I've got half of you, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Wow. Wow. Now, what does lukewarm mean? What is that all about? Well, it's a little bit in, a little bit out, a little bit up, a little bit down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. Tonight, before we go any further, I want to make sure that everybody in this place is right with God. 
wholehearted for Jesus Christ. We want to make sure that it's not just a commitment that, yeah, I show up to church or I call myself a Christian. Listen, you can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, and that makes you a Christian. It doesn't work like that. Sometimes we think the, the most crazy thoughts about how to get to heaven. We think, you know, if I just go to church or if I was raised in church or if I do a lot of good deeds, that God will let me into heaven. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that any of that stuff gets you into heaven? This is not about how much good you can do or what sort of a group you belong to or if you call yourself something that makes you that. It doesn't work like that. And if that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, then, hey, I love you enough to tell you the truth tonight. You're not going to make it. I want to make sure that you're right with God before you leave this place. Jesus said that in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it to the coals, made it out to be some goofy weirdo stuff, made it look silly, and, and, and just raked it through the coals in movies and television and books and the internet. But listen, this is not about what society says. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. If you haven't yet done that, then I love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. And tonight, come on, it's time for you to stop messing with God. Give God all of your heart. Give God all of your life. 100% commitment to Jesus Christ. Otherwise, not going to make it. In a moment, I'm going to go like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hand on my Bible right here. When you hear the sound of that pop, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, listen, I want to make a wholehearted, wholehearted commitment to Jesus Christ. I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, wait a second, wait a second. If I raise my hand, you know, people will see me, and, and I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. It's time to get over that embarrassment. Listen, wholehearted commitment doesn't care what the crowd thinks. And think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever? Listen, no one would make that trade. Come on, tonight you can push past that embarrassment. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than being away from God. And you can give all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. Sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right. Or you can get right with God by simply raising your hand and acknowledging your need for Jesus. I'll see it go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. And listen, everybody else in the room is rooting for you. We're all excited for you. We all did this at one time or another in one way or another. So you can get right with God in this safe and friendly place, knowing that the people around you are cheering you on. Who should raise their hand in a moment? You've been running from God instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus and given them all your heart and your life? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're half-hearted, lukewarm in your commitment to Jesus? And you know that's the condition of your heart when I describe it. Hey, come on. You can make a right relationship with Jesus Christ tonight. All across this auditorium, wherever you're at, back in the family rooms, if you're watching my television in the foyer or down there in the Love Rock Cafe or even online tonight, hey, you can raise your hand. God is watching. Okay, I'm going to count to three, pop my hand on this Bible as they turn the lights up. And I'm going to count to three, pop my hands, and then that's your time. That's your cue. If you want to give God all your heart and all your life, just to simply raise your hand and acknowledge your need for Jesus, I'll see it. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Here we go all together on the count of three. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one, two, three. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Give me some lights, guys. Give me some lights. Okay, three, four, five, six. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Six wise people already. Anybody else? Real quick. Just pop them up. Seven. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? You know you need to give God all your heart. Eight. Thank you. Is there another one? Nine right there. Thank you. Nine wise people. We're at number 10. Number 10. If you're sitting there wondering if you should, come on, you should. Thank you, number 10. Come on, if that's you, just lift your hand up high and say, yeah, I need to do that. I need to do that. Anybody else? Anybody else? We're cooked. Just wave it at me if you've got your hand up. Thank you. Thank you. Number 11. Come on. About a dozen wise people. Where are you at? Number 12. Come on. Come on. Let's give God all of our heart and all of our life. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? That's you and you know you need to do this. Come on. You can get right with God. Anybody else? Anybody else? One last, one last call, man. If you were saying, oh, man, I wonder if I should. Hey, God is saying, come on. Don't miss this opportunity. Anybody else? Anybody else? In this section? Anybody else over here? All right. Let's give the Lord a hand for 12 wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good. 
All, all 11 of you, are you number 12, 13, 14, or number 15? You should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. And when we're all going to stand, give a clap and a shout as we do that. I want you to get your stuff, get in the aisle, get a friend if you need a friend, and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. So if that's you, just get up, get up right now. Come on, let's give them a hand. No one leave during this time. Let them come forward. And you come right now. If you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, just make your way to the front right now. Come on. Come on down. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand. Come on, you can come too. They're still coming. Come on, nudge your neighbor. Say, come on, friend. I'll go with you. Come on, come on, come on. Anybody else? All right. Hey, you guys up front. Take a look up here. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, all right? Came to give God all your heart and all of your life. Right over here to my right, your left, this is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Listen, you already got past me and my wife. That's about as weird as it's going to get tonight, okay? He's cool. Nothing weird is going to go on. He's going to give you some free stuff. He's going to pray with you a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. He'll, he'll just describe some things that are available to you absolutely free. You need to do it, okay? Then I'll let you come right back out, and you can rejoin the church service in progress, and it'll be great, okay? So if you guys want to make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel, let's give him a hand as they go right there. Hallelujah. Stay. We'd like to call up the panel. We are going to have a panel on commitment tonight. So we just got like a little 10-minute thing that Dan and I did. So I want to introduce the panel to you since Pastor Dan, you did the altar call, do this. Larry Reynolds, where are you? Larry. We love Larry Reynolds around here. He's amazing. Larry Reynolds is a man of God. He is somebody that has spoken into Dan and I's life. Come on up. Make yourself at home, buddy. We got some fast facts on Larry up there. He's been married 29 years, got five kids, two of them adopted. They're wonderful. And they just uh, he's adopted He's involved them. in the marriage ministry and our school of ministry is one of our instructors, and his profession is sports agent. How cool is that, man? That's cool. awesome. And Larry, Larry was a pro ball player too, right? Yeah. He, he, he was. Is it on? Is it on? Here. He got it. Was. Was. There it is. There it is. Yeah, he was a pro ball player. And so, uh, Larry, oh you're just too cool, man. Okay, and then I want to introduce this one. This woman has impacted my life more than she will ever, ever know. I think she is one of the best preachers in the whole entire world. Her name is Deborah Cobre, and she is the mama in the house. A.K.A. mom. So come on up here. She's a mom of four of us, three girls, one boy. Poor Luke is all by himself. And we have, there's 12 grandkids. You go ahead and sit right here next to Larry. And then, um, and what else? She's been married to my dad 32, 34 and a half years, 34 and a half years. And um, she's a senior pastor, and she has started every ministry around here. So <laughs> thank you for coming. And then you guys can go ahead and have a seat. We can sit down too, Dan, if you can want. We? Yeah, All let's right. be casual. Okay. And then the next one is Pastor Richard. Do you want to talk about Pastor Richard? Oh, I'd love to talk about Pastor Richard. <laughs> He's got his own following in here. You heard all the youth screaming for him right now. Pastor Richard is so cool. He's my hero. Pastor Richard is awesome. He's our youth pastor. Pastor Richard's homegrown, for those of you guys that don't know. Pastor Richard started. We got mics over here, too, I thought. Yeah, we got... Uh, I think they gave Pastor Deborah an extra over there. It's all good. You've got two... See, he's such a preacher, he's got to have two mics. So anyways, uh, he's been married for 10 years, a decade, 30 years old, 31 years old, 31 years old, and uh, he's, he's homegrown in the house. He's involved in our youth ministry, also one of the instructors at the Rock Bible College. He's one of the pastors here on staff. But you know what? He's got uh, two and a half kids. That's pretty amazing. So you got a yeah. bun in the oven right now, huh? I do. The bun is toasting, and um, this child is going to be pretty cute. So. Awesome. Little baby girl coming in this August. And what her is her debut. name? Uh, baby Juliet. Baby Juliet. Juliet. How sweet is that? And Pastor Richard... Started in our youth ministry. That's right, age 14. Age 14, okay, and then became one of the interns. Yep, first. Okay, and then he was the first 
one of the first two interns. Yeah, my, my, myself and my wife, we were the first two, the guinea pigs. So, so Pastor Richard and Pastor Michelle, before they were married, were the first two interns. So they spent a lot of time together, had to work very closely together. And somewhere along the way, they just fell in love, right? Somehow, some way, oh, it man. just... I, I couldn't resist her charm. She, I go. was in the office with them, and they were so like, hee, hee, ha, hee, ha. It was obvious that they were going to get married. So then Pastor Richard eventually became the assistant youth pastor, and then when we uh, planted Pastor Eddie and Donna Elgar out there in, in the Coachella Valley Desert, Pastor Richard became our senior youth pastor. God is good. All right, you want to introduce the next one? Yeah, and P.S., his wife is the one emceeing the night, Pastor Michelle. So yeah, if you want yeah. to connect the pastors and their wives. And then Pastor Paul. Paul. Woohoo! He's our pastor Gando. of our Iglesia La Roca. And we love him. He's been amazing. He is such, um, he is such a vital part of our staff. He is, um, was over the Bible college as well. He is now senior pastor in La Roca because it is growing out of its seams. So we got to get this church paid off so that we can build another campus on the other end for La Roca. So we are excited about Pastor Powell being on our team. We love him. He's Fun amazing. Fact. Fun fact about Pastor Powell is that he was born in the Dominican Republic mm-hmm. on an island, right? The island... Double island nation, double nation island. Yeah, it's, uh, it's got Haiti and Dominican Republic. Most people know Haiti, but the island is called Hispaniola and has two countries in the same island. Doesn't it sound wonderful wow. rolling off of his tongue? <laughs> Can you just say Española again? Española. Man, that was awesome. <laughs> and his wife, Tracy, was the one leading uh, the, the, the third song. There's a magnificent. Yeah, magnificent. She, she was up here leading us, and, and they are the dynamic duo of La Roca. So that's good. God is so good. And well, he was a dentist. He was a dentist. And he gave it up for the gospel, so. Yes. And so instead of looking at people's mouths, now he, they look at his mouth. All right. All right. Well, we're going to get to our first question. And, Larry, we're going to start with you. Are you ready? It is, how do I stay committed in marriage that has no love and respect? Okay. Um, start with me, saving the best for last, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> How do you stay committed in marriage when things aren't going so good? Um, I think first thing is you may want to consider rededicating your marriage to Christ, regardless of where you're at. It could be 10 years down the road, 20 years, two days, hopefully not two days. It's been a tough honeymoon. Um, but you, you should dedic- rededicate your life possibly, but put your marriage under God. Humble yourself to God. And sometimes you may want to think about stopping and communicating. Sometimes when there's problems, you allow them to keep going on without stopping and saying, hey, here's an issue that we need to discuss. If you're at a point where there's bitterness and there's a lot of things going on in your relationship, the fruit of the Spirit probably is not flowing the way it should be. You know, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, patience, gentleness, self-control, over in, talked about it in Galatians. But one thing I'd focus on here, and I'm sure the panel can add to this, because this is a subject that could probably go on for a good couple hours. Um, And that's you need to uh, get an understanding. You have to work at humbling yourself and work on you. A lot of times you want to point at the person next to your wife or your husband. But if you begin to work on yourself, it can impact that relationship. Um, we're, we're friends with this group called the Winans, and they had this little song. It says, get off the do-nothing shelf and get to work on yourself. Think about it. If you handle your side of the relationship, it's probably going to impact the entire relationship. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time, even in a relationship. And I'm, I'm sure we can, you guys can add to this, but it's important that you, the individual, you, the husband, you, the wife, handle your side of the, of, the, of the deal, of the commitment, and it probably will improve the relationship. That's good. Does anybody else have maybe a little tidbit or anything that you want to add? No? All right, well, then we're going to move right along. He's a man. You want to do this one? Do I want? Yeah. Uh, the question is, when committed to God, it can seem lonely in this ungodly world. What were some things that kept you committed to your walk in times of pressure? I think anybody who's started a walk with God feels that at some point or another. It's lonely. 
you know, maybe you gave up your friends, that sort of a thing. And so we wanted to ask Pastor Deborah, when you uh, committed your life to God and said, this is it, I'm committed to Jesus, this is, this is where I'm at, and dealing with that pressure, that loneliness, and all the things associated with that, how do you stay committed? Well, I think um, that's a big question over the years. But there's two things that have always been very, very real to me. And that is, number one, the love of God drew me, but the fear of God keeps me. And to whom much is forgiven, much is loved. And I never forgot, I'm going to be 63 this year, and it's been, you know, 40 plus years since I came back to the Lord, but I've never forgotten where I came from. I never forgot how much sin I was in through my own fault and my own rebellion. And here's this magnificent, incredible God that forgave me of everything. And to whom much is forgiven, there is much love. And so my heart, I think about it. I don't dwell on the past, but I remember where I came from and what God's done for me. So I have a grateful heart. And I believe that that love draws me and keeps me. And then the fear of God, or the love of God draws me, and the fear of God keeps me. I'm afraid of God. I know that there is a responsibility that I've been given in my life to be a believer to be married to Pastor Jim, to raise my children, to be a pastor in this church and in this house. I know that that responsibility carries with it something called accountability and that I will be accountable and I am accountable to heaven. So whether you see me or not or whether you like me or not or whether you think I'm all that or you think I'm horrible and whether I can pull the wool over your eyes and I can, you know, charm is deceiving and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Because ultimately, the bottom line is God sees everything. He sees everything in the midnight hour. He sees what we're doing when nobody else is around. He knows us. He loves us and he knows us. And I believe the fear of God is that keeping agent that a believer understands that there's judgment coming. There's a judgment seat that I'm living for eternity, and that this world and this life that I'm living right now, whether it's good or whether it's bad, and there's been a lot of years when Jim and I, we had a very difficult time pastoring. Our hearts were broken. I mean, it, it's still, there's still extreme challenges in our lives, but we understand to whom much is given, much is required, that there's an accountability. So the love of God drew me, and the love of God keeps me. I mean, the fear of God keeps me. That's awesome. Brilliant. Does anybody else want to say anything on that note? I don't want to follow that. I know. <laughs> that was like perfect. Okay. All right. Well, Pastor Paul, will speak of, let's ask you a question. How do you stay committed to tithing when you have no more money left in your check? Good. That's a great question. Actually, I, I want to start committing is something uh, very, very important to me because it was, a, it was a process in my own life. When I first came to this church, September 2004, I remember I was sitting in that aisle in the back, and Pastor Jim said something that set me free through all my Christian walk and actually sent me to a new level. He said, commitment without consistency is no commitment at all. I don't remember what he preached. I don't remember what happened in that service, but I remember that word changed my life. See, because I was a committed Christian. I've been in the gospel all my life, but I was never a consistent Christian. And so in every area, in everything you do, consistency and commitment is so important. You can say you're committed, but if you're not consistent, you're not really committed. I mean, it's maybe a great idea, but there's no true commitment. And for me, that was huge, a tremendous, a great process to jump into not being only committed and saying I am a Christian, but being a consistent Christian. And giving is one of those things where in my family, with my wife and I, we've been consistent in all of our lives. I mean, we've been consistent. Since I was young, my, my mama taught me when I went to church, hey, you tithe, you give. I've always done it. But consistency also has to do with what Pastor was saying, with the heart of love. So you can give money. You can be great at giving money. But if your heart is not connected to what you do, then your commitment is just a mechanical action. So if your money's short and everything else you need to do, you got to stay consistent to God. That's it. I remember going into a financial advisor when my wife and I were looking to fix our finances, do these things. And the finances, they look at everything, what you spend, how you spend it. And I remember he came to us and said, this is great. We can do this, this, cut here so you guys can get out of debt. And he said, but this amount, you're giving too much to the church. And I remember, I remember, I mean, I said in my heart and I told my wife, I said, hey, man, everything on this paper is up for grabs except for that. 
everything else. I'll cut the cable. We'll go somewhere else to eat. We'll stay home. That, don't touch it. We can talk about everything else. So if you're going to be consistent in giving and you want to see God act in your life in tithing, you have to make God a priority. Absolutely. You cannot. I don't care how poor you are. I grew up poor. I had holes in my shoes. I come from a third world country. I know what poor is. I was raised by a widow. So don't talk to me about poverty. Talk to me about consistency. If you're going to do it, you have got to commit to what God wants in your life. And that's, there's no way around it. Larry, you got some on this? No. That's no? Good. That was outstanding. Come on, man. I got plenty, but not after that. that yeah. outstanding. Nobody wants to follow anybody else. Well, I'll say amen. Oh, there amen. you go. I oh, that's good. I know one thing uh, personally for Pastor Jess and I, just to jump off of what uh, Dr. Paul already said, is, is the con consistency and as well the priority. When uh, we were in Bible college, we, you know, it was like, okay, here went tuition, here went bills, and then we got like $20 left for two weeks, you know? And we were working at uh, one of the warehouse stores there in, in the city that we were, we were staying in. And um, I remember we were just, there was a time where we looked at our budget. We had to do a budget for one of our classes. And we were $400 on paper on the budget, $400 in the negative. And we looked at each other and we said, how are we even making it? And the only thing we could come up with it was, well, you know, the, the tithe is, is so important, and we do it, and God opens up the windows and pours out the blessing we can't contain. So God's blessing just swallows up the 400 and then we got $20 left over. Yeah, but in that story, right. what happened was we were stressed. I mean, when you know that it's tied at the end of the month, and you're like, ah, and I just remember praying while I was doing the bills, and I'm asking God, what is wrong? And I just remember looking at the bills going, what is wrong? You know, like frustrated with the Lord. And he said, well, where is your tithe? And I said, right there. And he's like, at the bottom of the list. And I'm like, oh, need to move it up to the top. And so I told Dan, I think we've been doing this wrong. So we moved our tithe to the first. So every time we got our bill, we just pay our tithe. And, or I'm sorry, every time we got our paycheck, then we pay the tithe. And it's crazy how after that, everything just started flowing. We didn't get any more money. Nothing changed. But God always met our need. We never yeah. lacked for anything. I think we went from $20 to forty dollars. Yeah, and we ate out. We got to go on a date like once. Yeah, a month. two dollar movie theater and Taco Bell. We even got to take Luke out. We even got to take Luke out, even though he had his own money. If I can add something, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if yeah. I can add something to what you were saying, Pastor Justice, there's one thing I was talking with the people at Roca today about this specifically because it's something I did. There was a mistake I did, and I remember I think I shared it here one time where I was praying, saying, "God, I'm, I'm tithing. I'm giving. I'm committed." I mean, I'm doing this. You know how you, like, put $20 and you want to roll, like Pastor Jim says, the slot machine of heaven because you want that to come back as soon as possible, you know? Um, but I remember I was praying to him, God, God, what's going on? How come I can't get it? And God showed me an angel with his hands tied down. I was like, wow, that's a weird vision. So I had to ask God, what does that mean? And God said, even though you're giving it, you're cursing it. I said, how is that possible? And today I was teaching La Roca. When God um, did the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus did something amazing. He said he took what he had and he blessed it. And I looked for the word blessing in Greek. And you and I don't speak Greek, but the translation, literally, blessing of the word in Greek is eulogy, where you and I get eulogy, which means speak well of. And I said, that's it. As long as I speak well of what I have, God is going to find a way to multiply it for you, for our house, or for what you do. So I just grabbed the little bit that we had and said, God, thank you so much that even though my need is greater than what I have, somehow you're going to, you're going to figure out a way to multiply it in my life. And so you got to bless what you have. Stay committed and just say it. Just say, God, thank you that I have 20 and not zero. Thank you, Lord, that I have 50 and not, you know, 20. So just bless what you have, and you're going to see something amazing happen. So that's something I had to change. Very awesome. good. Awesome, yeah, awesome. Can I just say something real quick? Um, you know, for me, I have Vanessa and I have been tithing since we can't remember, and we've been on, in the poll line it was longer than probably most people in here. We made zero. Um, but we've been blessed. But what tithing does for us, it, it establishes a pattern of discipline. Not just with the tithe, but with the rest of our finances. I don't go out and eat five cheeseburgers anymore, all right? You, you, you discipline yourself because you've set a pattern at the top of the list by tithing. It will impact the rest of your financial life if you start tithing. And it's a lot easier to tithe when you're not making anything. 
It really is. Because now when you start making more money, it's a pattern that you've, you've developed. But tithing will impact the rest of your financial life, not just the 10%, but the other 90%. It'll help you spend wisely. And that's just all I can say. That's just how it's worked for Vanessa and myself. Awesome. Very good. Good. Here's a, here's a good question, and, and maybe some of our uh, youth and young adults can relate in this area too, and some of the adults. But it says, uh, how do I commit to loving my parents? You know, the Bible says to honor your father and mother. How do I commit to that when they've hurt me or been horrible parents? And this can also apply to friendships. This can apply to work relationships, all that kind of stuff. But we wanted to send this one to Pastor Richard. How do, how do you commit to your parents, to honoring them, to loving them, when they're not doing what we think they should be doing according to what the Word says? Well, you know, I, I think that's a really important question because especially being in youth ministry, that's one of the main issues and conversations we have is my mom did this, my kid won't do this. I, the, the tension is great in, in families, especially the way things are set up now in these days with blended families and, 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 and fragmented families. But I think there has to come a point, especially for our young people, is we've got to make a decision. When do I stop being the victim and when do I start living in victory? And this is what I mean in this, is you have to make a decision to where the decisions my parents make will either define me or I will let the word of God define me. Yeah. You know, I mean, at, at, at the Rock Church, we are a fighting church. So you have to fight to say, look, no matter how difficult or challenging my family situation is, no matter how much I may disagree with the decisions my parents are making, I will still remain faithful to what God has called me to do. You know, in, 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 in Ephesians, it, 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 um, the Apostle Paul, he writes and talks about uh, the commandment, honor your mother and father. And then right after that, he says in the next verse, he says, honor your father and mother because it's the, it, it's the commandment with a promise attached to it. And he says again, he, then he says, now fathers, don't provoke your children. Again, in Colossians, he says the same thing. He says, honor your father and mother. Fathers, don't provoke your children to frustration. But, but the thing is this, is those are two separate commandments. He doesn't say, children, honor your parents as long as your parents aren't frustrating you. He says, no, no, these are two separate situations. They're not contingent one upon the other. No, no children, your job is to honor your parents, whether they're horrible, whether they're good, whatever the case may be, because there's a promise attached to it. So you have to define that within yourself and say, look, I, I'm not going to be faithful to God because my situation is rosy and pretty. I'm going to be faithful to God because God is faithful. Yeah. I mean, with, with my family, I, when I gave my heart to the Lord, um, I was the only one that went to church. My mom would drop me off at church. Dad wouldn't talk about it. My brother, my family, I had family members saying, you're brainwashed, you're leaving the family, you're spending, you're spending too much time at church. We have to reevaluate these things. And, and that's, what, that's what I got from my, my, my family for years. You know, it, it, was, it was very difficult and challenging, especially when I began to come to church. My parents began to go through a really challenging divorce. Very difficult, very, very challenging. And I had to make decisions. You know, how am I going to talk to my dad when I find out this has happened? How am I going to respect my mom, my family, when, when I find out these skeletons are coming out of the closet, when they're saying such difficult things about me? And, and it was a matter of, look, what has God called me to do? God's called me to be a good son, and I'm going to be a good son. You know, I, I does, they will deal with their relationship with God in their terms. And I'll tell you this, 13 years later, my brother walked down the aisles of this church and gave his heart to the Lord after 13 years of prayer. I, I'll tell you this, after a service, my aunt came to this church and we prayed the prayer of salvation in the parking lot with my aunt. I led her in the Lord. My mom, my mom gave her heart to the Lord at this church. You know, I, I, I'll, t I'll tell you this, you know, right, my aunt is having Bible studies in her house. She's getting ready to go to Bible college. My brother is reading the Word. I'm telling you this because I chose, instead of saying my family's horrible, my parents don't, I said, no, my God has done this. And the testimony of faithfulness is their lives are changed because, of, because I chose to, de to define myself by God and not my family. So I don't know, that's the best I got. You were a teenager when all that took place. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old here in this church. Yeah. I remember when you get dropped off. Yeah, my mom would drop me off. <laughs> they wouldn't come. <laughs> but it's good enough to drop me off. Hey, yeah. I, I, I got to say something. I'm, how many people in here have, have grew up in where your parents were divorced? Just raise your hand, all right? I'm raising my hands. My mom and dad were divorced when I was three years old, Okay. Not only that, is I never saw my dad till maybe I was in college. Matter of fact, I went to school up in the Bay Area. He lived in Oakland. I was playing baseball 30 minutes away. He didn't come to one of my games ever, all right? But I did not allow bitterness to take over my life. 
No excuses. If you're saved, you got abundantly above more than you asked in Jesus Christ. So if you're in that situation where you're in a single parent home or you grew up in that environment, God's more than enough. He can be your father, your mother, your doctor, your lawyer. He can be everything. Okay? And that's one of the things. Beautiful. I love that. Well, the verse that you talked about, um, children obey your parents, you know, for you will live a long, full life. We've always taught our children that. And the other day, I just had to tell a cute story. Um, One of our teachers in our Kids Rock, which is an awesome school, so if you need your kids to go to a good school, good one, there's a plug. That was for free. So, um, teacher Julie, she was talking about her grandmother who was like 97 years old this year, 98 years old. And Michael was like, mom, isn't that amazing? She's so old, you know, and it's just so cool. And Chloe pipes in and she goes, well, she must have obeyed her father and mother because she lived a long, full life. (laughs) And I just thought, wow, you know, what's bound up in the heart of a child, how beautiful, huh? So if they can remember that, you can remember that. So it is about eternity, really. It's not about what your parents have done to you. It's about what you have committed to God, and that is to love them. So, all right. And then is it Pastor Deborah? We have one more question for you. What is the difference between commitment to God and good intentions? That means there are people out there that go, oh, I'm a Christian. And sometimes they do the Christian thing. And then sometimes they decide, no, not today. I'm not going to do the Christian thing. But I have good intentions. What's the difference? Well, I, uh, that was a difficult question for me. And I thought about it because they gave us the questions before the panel, before they called us up here. And so I just looked up some definitions of commitment. So let's define commitment in the English language, which you did some of, but to commit means a responsibility. It's something that takes up time, energy, especially an obligation, devotion, or dedication to a cause, a person, or a relationship. Intention, something that somebody plans to do, the quality or state of having a purpose in mind. And so I was thinking about it, and I think the difference between commitment and good intentions could be said like this. Good intentions say, I want to do it. Commitment says, I do. It's like being engaged or being married. When you're engaged, you can still get out of it. But when you are at that altar and you are making a blood covenant before the Lord and you're saying your vows, you're saying, I do. I will. This is it. And the commitment is something in your heart that starts with a decision and that is carried out by faith and sacrifice and obedience. And God says that he's at work both to will and to do his good pleasure in us. So when we turn our hearts to him, he's at work to turn his heart to us. And he turns our heart and he begins to put his thoughts in our heart, his plans, his desires. All of these things begin to work in our hearts. And then he gives us the grace, God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on our behalf and we can't do it, right? My definition God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. So when I see in the word of God, this is what I'm to do, then I know that I've committed to that. I've come under that authority and that God will give me the grace to carry it out. So good intentions say I want to, but commitment says I'm doing it. It's in my life. That's it. God said it. That settles it. I'm doing it. Period. Anybody else have anything they want to add from the panel? No? You guys are a little bashful tonight. <laughs> well, we're going to do uh, one last one. And um, let's see. Let's pick a good one. Let's see what we got here. Uh, and this is for anybody. We'll just say this. Um, why? There's so many good ones. I know. We have lots of good oh, ones. Oh, I like this one. I like this one. If I'm a person that never completes something I'm engaged in, what advice would you give me to change and what does the word say about this? This is, this is up for grabs. I know you, uh, we, we had some names assigned to it, but if you, if you got something on it, go for it. So, you want to start us off, Larry? You want to start it? We originally said Larry, so we'll let Larry start because he's prepared. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, this, this word commitment, first of all, 
that when I heard about this, the first thing I thought about was a marathon runner. And we've talked about this at our house a lot. Um, but a marathon is 26 miles, 26.6 miles. We can't just go out there today and run 26 miles. You might be able to run 25 yards, 10 yards, 100 yards, but 26 miles is going to require some effort. It's going to require some vision. It's going to require some determination. You're going to have to have resiliency. When you scrape your knees and fall down, you better get up and keep running. If not, somebody might run you over. Commitment means enduring and sticking to it and committing until the finish, regardless of the cost, regardless of the race. So if somebody is out here and they say they can't complete a task, Proverbs 29, 18, what does it say? Without a vision, people perish. Do you have vision? Do you have goals in your life? Do something as simple as putting a to-do list together. In the morning, you get up, write down the 10 things I'm supposed to do today. And do them. Check them off. And make the commitment that you are going to finish. If you're going to start the task, finish the task. It, the, the saints often said, you know, people that uh, plan to fail, what do they do? They fail to plan, right? So you want to commit to something. The way you get things done is not, for me, this, I'm talking about Larry Reynolds. Don't make an emotional decision okay. on the beginning. See, if I make emotional decisions, it was an emotion that was involved, and I'm more likely to quit and give up. Yeah. But if I pray about it, I plan, if I calculate the cost, and I don't think calculating the cost is just talking about money. It's talking about th thinking through the whole process so you can go ahead and finish the task. So think about what you're doing before you commit to it, pray about it, and then you'll be successful, and you will indeed complete the task. Which but means it, that you have to say no sometimes. Sometimes you definitely have to say no. That's good. If I could just add, yeah. Larry, I think that's a great, a great, so maybe start with something small. Let's say you're a procrastinator, like I am, and you just don't ever finish anything. Would you say, let's start with one thing and carry that through? Well, for me, um, can you hear me? Okay. Just let's take prayer for a minute. Um, you know, a lot of us want to go out and pray the house down. I'm going to pray for two hours a day. For Larry Reynolds, I better start with two minutes so I can start and be consistent. I know I pray for two minutes. But somebody said, Larry, join me for two hours a day. I'm probably not going to get it done. So like you're saying, start with something you can establish. My son Justin gave me a little lesson. He said, if you do something for 21 days, Dad, it becomes a habit. It, you're, you're establishing a pattern in your life. And you're going to be successful if you can complete the task. And, and oftentimes, it's best to start with something small and something simple. Okay, I'm going to shut up. <laughs> no, that's good. You same, know, same question. Go ahead. Um, for me, one of the things for commitment that I, I, I plan my that I've had to learn is, uh, at least for me, maybe it's just a tragic way to look at it, but for, for me, commitment sometimes is pain. Yeah. And if I can get that in my head, there's a lot of things I can push. There was a verse in the Bible that I've always taken personal. You know, in my younger days, I learned Psalm 15. There's one verse that you want to cut it out because the verse says that you to your, you swear to your own hurt. I mean, I remember I said in Spanish, so I'm translating here. You swear to your own hurt and you change not. And so that is so, I mean, I've lost, I've lost money when I, was, when I was doing business because of that verse. I was just like, man, I, I wish I wouldn't have seen this verse because I can make some money here, you know. Um, but it was, the, it was the commitment. It was the point of I, I want to be honoring to God. Psalm 15 says, who would be with God? Who's going to be in the mountain of the Lord? And I want to be there. You want to be there. So if we want to be there, we want to put those things in our lives. So for me, consistency or commitment has to do sometimes with pushing through pain, uh, has to do with marathon, has to do with just keep going. And, and when I was 17, 18 years old, I ran a half marathon. And I remember halfway through that thing, I thought, man, this is insane. Who taught me? I mean, who, who talked me into going through this thing? This is crazy. But I remember there's a point where your mind flips, where pain kind of goes away, and you say, this is, I got to finish this. I got to just keep on going. And so I want to encourage many of you guys are new Christians. There's going to be pain. Your family may not like you. Things are going to get complicated. Your prayer life may not be consistent. Can you just show up at church? Can you just keep going? Can you push through the pain, through hurts in relationship? That's all God is asking you to do. So commit to going through those things, even when it doesn't look fun 
it's going to be awesome. Because there's moments where it just turns really, really great in my commitment with God, in my walk with God, just pushing through pain. Pastor Richard? Well, I think it's been said, but I mean, if I could just summarize it all in two things. I heard it said once, the only way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what you got to do. Take it small. Don't start off with the big and just chomp away one Man, bit at a time. you're too skinny to be eating an elephant, <laughs> so I'm sorry. I'm well, talking about eating an elephant. I mean, <laughs> it's been a rough year. What can I say? I mean, it's, I don't want to get over my waist size right now. It's, anyway, uh, but, and, and the other thing would be, I think we would all do ourselves a favor to commit to the right things. Uh, when, if, if we would learn to say no at the right times, we wouldn't find ourselves having to, having to fulfill tedious or meaningless things just to keep a good reputation or a name. And I think if we would say yes to the right things and no to the wrong things, I think we'd do ourselves a great favor in establishing a proper commitment and consistency um, to the things that we do. Awesome. One verse that uh, Pastor Jess and I, in our times, looking, uh, looking over what we're going to say tonight and, and the questions and things like that, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse number 37 says, But let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. And you, we heard this morning that there's none good but God, and good is what God says, God's will, God's way. Anything other than yes is yes and no is no is contrary to the ways of God. That's what evil is uh, defined by. And so when we see that in a commitment, if we're really going to commit to something, yes needs to be yes. And no needs to be no. So that's that. I love how the Apostle Paul says, when we came to you, it wasn't yes and no. It was either our yes was yes, our no was no, and we're committed to you. We love you. This is how we're going to operate. And you know that we're committed to the cause of Christ. You know what sort of people we are. You know what sort of people we were among you, he says. And that's how you see the commitment coming out of his life is that there was a, a standard, committing to the right things, sticking with it taking little pieces, all that kind of stuff. Hey, was this good for anybody tonight? Amen.